Hi everyone, welcome to your lesson B18.10, Factors Affecting Food Security. Well, I've got one objective for this lesson, which is um, you need to be able to link different factors that affect food security to how they could affect food supplies. So your quick task is a bit longer this time. I'd like you to try and recall from last lesson, what is incident energy? How much energy from the sun is used by plants and algae? And approximately how much biomass is lost at each trophic level? So write down your title date and objectives, complete your quick task while as you press pause and then press play when you're ready for the answers. Here are your answers for the quick task. The incident energy is the amount of light energy that reaches Earth and is used for photosynthesis by plants and algae, and that is 1%. And the amount of energy that's wasted approximately at each trophic level is 90%. Remember, that can vary widely, but, you know, generally speaking, we can see that about 90% is lost. Okay, we're um, revisiting a graph that you saw back in lesson um, 18.1, which was all about the human population explosion. So looking along the bottom axis here, we can see the year going this way and uh, the population number of humans on the planet going this way so if the human population is going to grow to over 10 billion by the year 2100 what resources are we going to need a lot more of you can discuss it pause the video and think or write a couple of bullet points So hopefully you have recalled um, from that lesson that as the birth rate increases, that affects the resources we need. And the main resources that we need are food, water, space for living or for growing crops and so forth, and sanitation, a way of getting rid of our waste. And the main one that we're going to focus today on is food. So as the birth rate increases, how are we going to make sure there's enough food for everyone to live? Just to start off with, I'd like you to get these key notes down. So um, write all these notes down, fill the gaps in as the video is paused. And when are you ready to press play? I'll give you the answers. And here are your answers. Food security means having enough food to feed a population. This means people must be able to access food and must be able to afford it. People also need a balanced diet so they do not become malnourished. There are many factors that affect the food security of the world and of different countries. We need to try and stop biological threats to food security so that everyone has the food they need. So I'm going to go through some of the main um, factors affecting food security now. So we'll start off with changing diets. So let's um, look at this example of quinoa. So quinoa was identified as a superfood. Um, superfood isn't actually a scientific term. It's just a marketing term, a marketing ploy, something people in diets use. So quinoa is very high in protein and low in carbohydrate. It's a very complete and healthy food. So it supplies a lot of the nutrients you need. And this meant that the price of it increased, so it became more popular, more people wanted it, so the price went up. And that was actually occurring in um, wealthier countries, for example, North America and Europe and the UK. Now, where does quinoa come from? Well, let's have a look at this map. As you can see um, on this South American map here, Peru and Bolivia have been highlighted. This is where quinoa is part of their staple diet. So just like wheat is a staple food in the UK and rice is a staple food in many Asian countries, in Peru and Bolivia, their staple food is quinoa. Now, the problem was that because the price increased, poorer Bolivians and Peruvians could no longer afford it. As I've mentioned, this quinoa, this grain, was um, very nutritious and very good food that provides a lot of the nutrients you need. But if poor people in Bolivia and Peru, um, um, Peru can't afford it, then they couldn't actually access that food. So actually, it caused um, malnutrition and food scarcity in Peru and Bolivia. Now, the flip side of that is that the price increases were beneficial to the farmers. So the farmers are people who are growing and eating the quinoa. So they grew it, they ate it themselves and any surplus was what they, they sold. Um, the price increases were beneficial to the farmers financially, but it was bad for their diets because what happened was they grew this quinoa. They didn't eat it themselves. They sold it and then they used the money that they made from selling it to buy like easier to cook fast foods that were more available so cheap pasta cheap potatoes things like that but pasta and potatoes are not as nutritious as quinoa so their families and their health would have been affected by that 
However, more recently, the price has decreased again because um, of farming elsewhere. So quinoa is now grown elsewhere. So um, quinoa is now grown in North America and in other areas. So we're not completely reliant on Peru and Bolivia for the quinoa that we buy in the supermarkets and stuff. But obviously, when the first rush of, um, you know, this new, exciting so-called superfood started, um, that actually had a really bad impact on Bolivians and Peruvians. So we need to make sure that our changing diets don't affect people in other countries just because we've got fatty food that we want to eat. If you're interested in me reading more about um, how quinoa affected different people in different countries, uh, there's a couple of links here to news articles. And if you don't want to type out the whole link, you could just type out quinoa BBC News or quinoa Guardian and see what the articles say. I'm sure they'll come up. OK, another um, factor that affects food security is new pests and new diseases. So because of the increase in global travel, different um, pests and organisms can end up traveling to different countries quite easily and also climate change and the example we're looking at here is called blue tongue disease and it's in sheep it happens in sheep and cattle what happens is this creature here is a type of midge and normally it can only survive in hot um, climates like um, in certain areas of Africa and North Africa um, but as um, climate change increases the temperatures globally and certainly in the UK, these midges are even able to travel across to the UK and affect our livestock. So this image here is um, a sheep who has blue tongue disease and um, is in the early stages. And you might not be able to super tell, but if I just draw around its cheek, can you see how its cheek is sort of bulging out on the lower edge here? And it has a kind of depressed appearance and it's... Um, not sort of staring off in space. I know it's a sheep and I tend to stare off in space. You don't expect them to be super intellectual, but the animals who suffer from blue tongue disease become depressed. They get um, swollen faces and swollen ears, and eventually they start to develop things like ulcers and sores on their hooves. And it's really very bad for the animal. We don't want them to suffer. So um, in order to combat this, Farmers are just being a little bit more alert during those times of years when it gets really hot. So, you know, when we get these heat waves in summer because that's the time at which these tiny flying insects can more easily get across to our country and possibly infect the um, uh, cattle and sheep that we have with the virus that they're carrying, this blue tongue disease virus. Another example I want to talk about was desert locusts. So desert locusts live in very hot countries and um, their numbers have been increasing because, again, of global warming. So normally they're confined to um, certain countries, which I'll list on the next slide, um, but they have been increasing both in number and in the areas they can reach because of global warming. Now, each insect is only um, two grams. So one, lo one um, desert locust roughly, its mass is two grams, but it can eat two grams worth of crops in a day. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but the problem is when they swarm. When they swarm, you get up to something like 100 billion locusts in one swarm. That sounds like a number that you can't really comprehend, but I've got a picture of that sort of on the next slide. Uh, this is an image of what it's like when locusts swarm. So here we can see, um, I believe this picture is taken in a farmland in Kenya. And this is a gentleman in the field who is obviously halfway through doing his work for that day or whatever. And suddenly the locust swarm just moves in. And within an hour, they can destroy an entire crop. So that would be completely gone within the space of one hour. And then they move on and destroy another crop. So normally the affected areas I've listed up here are the Gulf states, East African countries, India, Pakistan, Iran, and um, Yemen. Now, recently, because of the increase in temperatures, other countries and, and areas are not normally affected, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kuwait, Bahrain, and Qatar are being affected. So how can we combat them? Well, um, a lot of the time people are trying to spray pesticides on them. Pesticides means chemicals that kill um, insects but at the moment there's not enough airplanes and not enough pesticide to go around because people are being overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of locusts so one thing that's happening is um china have some experts that they're sending out to their neighboring pakistan um, along that border where they know pakistan um to deploy ducks so they have a um, hundred thousand ducks that they're going to send into the area and the ducks eat the locusts and ducks can eat up to something like 210 locusts in a day so hopefully that's a good natural way of trying to get rid of the locusts because the pesticides um, are just not able to keep up with the job at the moment. 
Okay, so here's your first task. I want you to use information from the video I've already talked through, and if you want to, you can also use page 304 and 305 of your AQA Biology book on Caboodle. I want you to write three sentences to describe how the following can cause food insecurity. So, an increasing population, changing diets, or new pests or diseases. So, pause the video, write at least one sentence for each of those, and press play when you're ready to move on. OK, and we're going to carry on looking at some more of these factors that can affect food security. And the next one we're looking at is environmental changes. So climate change can lead to flooding or drought. So in the picture on the bottom left, we have drought that's occurred in this field of corn. As you can see, if they don't have enough water, they can't survive. Um, the picture on the right here is um, actually taken in Spain um, in September 2019 after some really severe storms. And these are all the citrus trees in a particular farm area. And um, even just in one area of Spain after this um, storm that occurred, Storm Dana, I believe it was called, there was um, 100 million euros worth of damage done to crops, including citrus fruits, um, potatoes, carrots, onions, all those sorts of um, uh, crops that are grown there. Now, in terms of Spain and that happening, OK, there was a financial cost. But more importantly, if this occurs in a country that's not as wealthy or it's a developing country, it can lead to malnutrition and starvation. So if we look at um, places um, who have recently been affected or in the last 10 years been affected, like Somalia and Pakistan by flooding and drought, again, there's a, there's a massive human cost. So obviously we really need to be careful and make sure that this doesn't affect people. So one way in which we can actually manage that is by um, genetically, genetically modifying crops. So in the picture at the bottom, you can see these tomatoes here, and they're actually genetically modified to be resistant to tomato blight. And this tomato here, you can see, has been affected by tomato blight, which is a disease. So if one field full of tomatoes gets this disease and the disease spreads from one plant to another, that could just destroy your entire crop. But if we genetically modify tomatoes so that they're resistant to the disease, it means that the crop won't be destroyed. So looking at these bullet points then, GM crops can be made resistant to flooding, they can be made resistant to drought or disease, but the problem is that could increase the cost of seeds. Now, there are um, companies who are quite ethical out there who do genetically modify crops to be resistant to flooding and drought. So they can be used in countries that are more affected by flooding and drought, but they don't increase the cost of seed that much. So actually, you know, there are measures in place. And there are companies and um, organisations trying to work to make sure that these seeds are still available for people who are in developing countries. Another thing to bear in mind is agricultural inputs also include the cost of watering systems, pesticides and herbicides. Now, their prices might be high, but the flip side of that, you do get an increase in the yield or the amount of crop produced. The last factor that affects uh, food availability that we're going to look at is conflict. So war and conflict affects citizens, their access to food and their ability to buy it. So some of the reasons that they are not able to access food can be um, extreme inflation of prices. So, you know, the, the economy is hit by um, the impacts of war and conflict, driving prices of everything up. So people can't even afford food, even if it's there. Uh, the destruction of water supplies by um, people who are engaging in the conflict and violence that affects civilians. So, for example, when people are suffering being um, under fire or bombing or things like that, it means they can't actually get out and get themselves food and the puts a higher strain on health services, which detracts from other services. There's, um, sadly, it's really frustrating that I always feel very impotent, like there's not really much we can do about it. But um, one of the things that's been heavily on my mind recently has been the crisis in Yemen. So um, one of the things that we can do is um, write to our um, MPs or write to our EU representatives um, or our UN Council representatives to try and get um, them to do something about the crisis in Yemen. So there's a massive humanitarian problem going on. It's just going to get worse. So if you're interested in sending an email to your MP, you can uh, follow the web address or easier is, is if you just go to Google and type Oxfam crisis in Yemen and then it'll take you to this page where you can send uh, a letter or an email to your MP and ask them to intervene.
Okay, so for the last part of your task, um, I would like you to do the same as you did earlier, using information from the video or pages 304 to 305 of the AQA book. Write three sentences to describe how the following can cause food insecurity. So we've just talked about environmental changes, the cost of agricultural inputs and conflicts. So pause the video, write your sentences for each of those and then press play when you're ready to move on. And today, as I mentioned, there was only one main objective, which was to link the different factors that affect food security to how they affect the food supplies. So again, smiley middle or sad face to rate your confidence level. And if you need to do any further study, you could check out other videos on YouTube, for example, Free Sites Lessons, Primrose Kitten or the Amoeba Sisters. You could look at BBC Bite Size website. Uh, you could use your AQA GCSE Biology textbook on Caboodle, looking at pages 304 to 305. And um, there are other websites that you can use as well, such as GCC Pod, Seneca Learning, or any other resources that you find useful. Uh, well done for all your work today, and I'll be uploading more videos next week.